May that one protect us both, may that one nourish us. May our study, may we work together with great vigor and energy and strength. May our study make us illumined. May we not unnecessarily Cavalry with each other, peace, peace, peace be unto all. Bonorte, live Gurulaya, the grace of God, all, all of you. So, this is the Vedanta question answer session. If you have no uh, questions, there are probably no answers. And th there was something related to uh, Gospel of Ramakrishna. You want to read that out for us? Yes. It was related to what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. How do you know if the room is real? Mm -hmm. So M says, whatever a person experiences in a particular state is real for him in that state. Mm -hmm. Suppose you're dreaming that you have gone to a garden. As long as the dream lasts, the garden is real for you. Mm -hmm. But you think of it as unreal when your mind undergoes a change as, for instance, when you're when you awake, when your mind attains the state in which one sees God, you will know God to be real. Okay, so the word reality is being used in this passage. I hope everybody heard the passage. And essentially is discussing what is the nature of reality. And it's a subject now that modern science itself has had to take up. Because the more we study, what we assume to be reality, the more questions and mysteries come up for us. That's the difficulty. My original question to the group here was, how do we know something exists? And uh, I don't know what your answers were. What were your answers? You perceive them. You perceive them. They are quite right. Yes, but our perception, I pointed out, is in a very narrow range. When you can't see it. You can't see one and one is two. No. Well, you, 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 in so terms of vi see, in terms of visual perspective, our whole range is the electromagnetic field, and our visual range is only a tiny, tiny percentage of that. So the spectrum that we use is really a registration of frequencies, and we have a mind or a brain that fills in the gaps. We won't debate whether it's mind or brain. That's another issue. But it's something that is material, somehow interprets and has to interpret because the human visual system is not very convenient. There are other animals that have a much better visual system, such as octopuses and so on. And they don't have to go through an intermediary. What I mean by that is that photons, light enters into a lens and it has to hit about 120,000 receptors at the back. But in the meantime, there's a whole network in the way. And we know, when we say we, I mean, psychologists well know and neuroscientists well know that if you put a number of obje objects and you ask what that is, let us say two-dimensional objects, and our interpretation is three-dimensional. And if you take, for example, two squares, gray squares, one adjoining the other with a line, the upper square will look a different shade of gray. But when you close one eye and put uh, an obstacle in front of the line, then the grayness is all restored. It all, all looks to be the same gray. So there are various optical adjustments, just in terms of optics, various optical adjustments that have to be made for us to make a compensation and make some sense of the world. Now, biological science would tell us that the reason why that is, is so that we can survive. 
not just survive, but thrive. And the way we survive is by, through procreation, making children. And that is the way, that is the mark of successful evolution, if that's what it boils down to. So there are two basic genetic directives, and that is propagating the species, that's on the one hand, without any explanation why there should be an urge to do that. And secondly, it is to stream negative entropy on ourselves. That is, to entropy is a measure of scrambleness, and we make things, we are complex entities, and we eat and drink and so on, and breathe and so on, and our system is highly complex, highly organized. It's not scrambled at all. So this term for scrambling is called entropy. You give some example. Uh, when you scramble eggs, you can't unscramble them. You can try. Maybe a useful experiment, maybe, or a useless experiment, depending. But once it's scrambled, you can't reverse it. So... Death, for example, exhibits the state of uh, entropy. That is, it goes into a more chaotic condition, a more widespread condition. The organizational structure disappears. So we interpret the world as our reality, and Sri Ramakrishna endorses this in the Gospel of Ramakrishna, because this question comes up again and again, and if we take the world just as we view it in a waking state, because there are other states that produce their own reality. So we have to qualify every statement now with in the waking state. And if we want to be philosophically minded, any question that arises, we have to say, please put an addendum on it in the waking state. So... Is this, uh, is this a sunny day in the waking state? Is a cloudy day in the waking state? So there is a practical, it's not just philosophy, there's a practical implication to those kinds of questions. Because if we view our reality in a different way and register it in a relative way, relative to what? Relative to an observer. There are stages in between. So relative to our senses, relative to the eyes, I can see dimensions and, and things that occupy space and objects. The problem is in relating to those things, it gives me pain and problems and difficulties. Therefore, there's every reason to see if I can shift my point of view and see if there's a much more liberating way to think of things and it is, and the more I do that, the closer I get to an absolute reality. So there are two things. One is a relative reality, and there are different states of it. And the state that I'm talking to you in, we have to register as a waking state, where the senses are alive, and the senses bring in information. And we then base all everything on those kinds of the, the in front presentation and then the reactions that go along with it. And if these reactions are not tamed or not monitored, then they produce some pain. Why do they produce pain? Because these two genetic directives are the pillars around which we organize all our life strategies. And you may not think you have a life strategy, but every person has a life strategy. And when we look into it from a psychological point of view, we realize these different life strategies. That's why we do the Enneagram, to discover what these life strategies were when we were one foot and everybody else was six foot in the waking state. <laughs> so from here on, we'll be very annoying. From here on, we'll qualify everything by saying in the waking state. <laughs> but there are other states also. 
So there's a beautiful story that Ram Krishna also gives to illustrate this. There was a farmer in the field and so on. And he went home after a day's work. That's how the story goes. Put it in a rural setting, people understand. You know, there was a busy person in the waking state. Then he goes to his house in the waking state. And his wife in the waking state is weeping. Why are you crying? Says he. She says, well, our son died. This is the worst possible thing that can happen in human life. This is the worst pain we can endure in the waking state. Then the wife is very upset because not only has she lost her son, but her husband is not grieving. And her husband was a person who thought a little deeper, kind of something like a philosopher, but not so much a philosopher as somebody who evaluated the relative experience on a broader basis other than the waking state. Why are you not grieving? He says, sit down, my dear, let me explain. Last night I had a dream. And I had, and I'm embellishing the story, not doing it as Ramakrishna told it, just to convey the idea and meaning. I had 12 healthy young sons. And we all lived in a grand palace. And what a tragedy. Unfortunately, they all went. They were all, they all died. And those that survived, they only survived as long as the dream was there. And then a waking state took over. And I don't know who to grieve for, those 12 boys or this one son in the waking state. Because when we evaluate a dream and dismiss it just as a mere dream, we're doing it from the waking state. We're not doing it from the dream state. In the dream state, the evaluation doesn't arise. We automatically take it to be a reality. And all the senses are employed. And every possibility can be put there. But the factor of time is there. The fact of space is there. Objects occupy that space. The only difference is instead of one ego in the waking state, the ego becomes multiple in a dream state because all the objects are part and parcel of the dreamer. Many, many egos are there. But all the criteria of name and form and causation and functionality and time and space, they're all there in a dream to the extent that if a lion comes and pounces on me in a dream, I might wake up in the waking state, come into the waking condition in a state of tremor and fear. And if it wasn't real at the time of dreaming, that wouldn't happen. And many people will experience the same kinds of things. Many people will experience the frustration of running and not reaching your destination. So it suggests, of course, that there are components from the waking state that we bring across. But we didn't have to apply for any visa to bring it across. So that in the waking state, if the Swami now falls down and breaks his leg and it develops into a gangrenous condition, and you take this Swami off to the hospital. As you know, the Swami in the waking state doesn't like waking state hospitals. Anyway, they cut the leg off. They put it in a bucket. And I say my farewells. Maybe it'll meet me on the other side, along with teeth and other things. All right. But then a transition occurs. Somehow in the dream state, Two legs are there and I play football. So how was this leg that went off in a bucket, repackaged and come back and sewed on to the body in a dream state? That mystery is there. So which is real, which is unreal? We can't see. The one comes, the one goes. Waking state is there like a good strain. It came a station master on a platform saw it and it went off. Another train comes along, a dream, 
many passengers getting on, getting out, and going on its way. So far, I never came with the first train, and I never went with the second train. And then a third train comes along. There are no passengers, there are no goods. In fact, there's no time, there's no space, there's no causation, there's no function. That is called deep sleep. It is not a nothingness because I'm able to recall it was peaceful. A kind of consciousness is there. And even if you put somebody under anesthetic or they go into a coma, even still, they're aware that something is there. It may not take the shape of people and places and events. There's no time in it, no space in it. But there is a consciousness going on that allows the waking body to continue. Continue breathing, continue all the functions, the unconscious functions, because the unconscious mind is still there. So when we say what is real, we have to bring out the subject of consciousness. And a psychologist, a neuroscientist, actually called David Chalmers, brought up this, a philosopher, brought up this question of what is consciousness in the phraseology of consciousness is the hard problem. And on his investigation, he comes to a conclusion called panpsychism. Panpsychism is a very old, old understanding belonging to the Vedanta that tells us that there is only a one single consciousness. This consciousness is exhibiting itself through all these various states, what we call reality, and coming out as moving, conscious, self-conscious things and arriving at the height of its manifestation, that is thinking man. And even that, can be dispensed with. So that when, through different approaches, through a revaluation of things, a person does away with all of these things in a state of meditation, in a state of the culmination of meditation of samadhi, then all of these things go away. And there we find consciousness itself sitting. That then is what we call an absolute reality. That absolute reality never changes, like the station master standing on the platform, seeing the trains coming and going, didn't come with the first one, didn't go with the last one. These three states of consciousness are there and they are observed. There was a time when the body that you have now in the waking state didn't have this shape, didn't have this form, didn't have this identity. It was something a small single cell organism, a zygote, with no features. And then somehow that grew into various features and you wouldn't suspect that it was there and you wouldn't suspect that you were there. So how does all this form? And how does it, is it that we get some idea of reality? And then there is the other aspect that the reality is based on the way we think. Because that fundamental entity seems to be something like, and we know it from scripture, a knower, a thinker, a witness. We discussed this yesterday in dealing with the Upanishads. And therefore, every thought must be infallible. And the thought comes out as the waking and the dream. When... Uh, Yoga philosophy discusses the condition of the mind as a series of waves appearing and disappearing. These waves, five of them. Naturally, if there are five waves, subtle in character, not being able to be seen directly because most of the waves that constitute the universe we cannot see or hear or touch or taste. The electromagnetic field is huge. And all the sense organs of the body would have to relate to some variety of it. And so we only catch a narrow band. Supersonic sound is outside our range. A dog has it. Subsonic sound, something different. 
or the other way around, subsonic sound dog catches. There are people who direct sheep dogs to help them control sheep and they blow a whistle. You can't hear it, human ear can't catch it. The dog's ear can catch it. So all our instruments are not standard. They're designed only for us to relate to an obscured truth. Now there's a, somebody called, uh, I think his name is David Hoffman. I always get it wrong. Uh, I'll have to con confirm that. Anyway, he's uh, managed to formulate some of this into, in a scientific way with mathematical formula and so on. And he's come up with a wonderful metaphor for how this is all obscured. So right now, you're looking at a computer screen. Supposing you have a pretty much blank computer screen with one small icon in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. You know that that icon is only a representation of something that it, some information it contains. But the icon itself will hide the real inner workings of the computer because the icon is not an intrinsic part of the computer. The icon is just a representation. But behind that are diodes and ele electronic connections subtly soldered components. All of that is obscured to our vision. Even if we take the human body, there are very few people who will actually take the time and trouble to understand the physiology and anatomy of their body. So they can go to an allopathic doctor and the doctor will prescribe some medicine and we rely on their diagnosis and we won't challenge it because we don't know any better. If you're a little wiser, you'll understand the anatomy and physiology of the body and you'll challenge anything in the allopathic medicine because you'll maybe realize that what is being prescribed is for a symptom, not a cause. And if a medication is prescribed, how many patients say, please tell me, what are all the contraindications of this? Can you please tell me what the various, uh, uh, various negative aspects of this are? And, uh, and what is the mechanism even of how this works? Because the doctor won't have time to do that. You know, doctors turn around time with every patient. It's something like ranging between five and 15 minutes, 15 minutes maximum, averaging about 10. It's a kind of factory. You go in, something happens, and more than likely you're dispatched to a consultant or given a prescription or whatever, and out, out it goes. And each person will, in this country anyway, will pay a fee for that if they're not on the medical aid. And so we can understand, you know, why a doctor prays, Lord, give me sick people. May everybody fall sick. Because if he doesn't have that, his market dries up. The sick person is saying, Lord, make me healthy. Mm -hmm. The doctor is saying, may people fall sick. So that's the curious nature of it. So we don't understand, nor do we wish to understand, for the most part, the depths of what we're dealing with. But it was these ancient philosophers in the Upanishads that understood that this is not what we think it is. And we are biologically programmed to understand it in a different way. Otherwise the game of life discontinues. And shifting this life to the point of view that it is a game or a play is a useful strategy with a great, great antidote for all our difficulties called a sense of humor. We can see it in its proper perspective, like a game, like a play, 
And then if we decide we can take a sporting attitude with it, that would be a wonderful thing. Something like a tennis game, as I described before, where a ball is lobbed, and instead of me begging, please don't give me any difficulties, every day we make a, a, a request, and maybe at the end of the day, we make a complaint. What's the complaint? Lord, you never gave me a curveball today. Please give me a curveball. I'm expecting some difficulty, except I don't take it as a difficulty. I take it as your loving ball hurled at me so that I can learn some kind of skill and how to deal with it, how to get around it. How to get around it, not how to confront it. Confronting is the bad technique. Do I look at it in this correct perspective with a great deal of faith that all the so-called problems that come my way come with their solutions. But I have to look at it in a creative way, in a sporting way, with a certain delight and sense of humor to see. If I shuffle through all the possible solutions, something will come. And that come will be that will be the most suitable creative solution to that particular problem. What we might call the twentieth elephant. I, those who are familiar with my twentieth elephant story will understand what I'm saying. I'll try to make it short. So you see, there were some sons of a a, a wise and wealthy man who died. But he, curiously, his wealth was all in elephants. Now he had 19 elephants, and they had to be divided amongst the sons. One son would get one half, one son one quarter, one son one fifth. What use is a fifth of an elephant? Or a half an elephant, you chop a thing in half. What use is a fraction of an elephant? So they were puzzling out how that works. And then it so happened that royal elephants were passing in order to go for their bath. And the leader and master of the elephants saw the difficulties and he was a mathematician. So he said, wait, 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 I'll solve your problem. You can borrow one of my elephants. So 20 elephants being there, he said, now make your division. So the first son took half the 10 elephants one quarter elephant, one fifth elephant, and so on and so forth. It all worked up, squares nicely, and he said, the extra one you give back to me. So somehow we have to look for a 20th elephant. And it arrives when the mind is not particularly occupied with something, but we are revisiting, we are churning up all the possibilities from an area of creativity. And that area of creativity would have to be something like the dreamless sleep component where everything is poised in a state of potentiality, where we pause and wait, sit in a poised area, and something comes in. So that from the position of the three states of consciousness, the deep sleep is the most creative, potentially the most creative area. And what happens on the microcosm will happen on the macrocosm is a law. So is there a creative area, something like that in the universe? Yes. So we call this nature itself, an area where nothing is happening. And every area where everything is kept in potentiality and then erupts into subtle areas. Something like a dream. And a dream requires a cosmic mind. Now we find this idea of panpsychism coming in, a kind of monistic point of view that says, if we find that all things are conscious and consciousness is a hard problem, we can solve it. We can solve it by declaring things in different ways, different expressions. Collective consciousness will be one way, is Carl Jung's way. And the Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger, who gave a series of lectures in 1940 here in Dublin. He put in his series of lectures, now compiled as a, a book, What is Life? Consciousness can only be a singularity. 
So there is every reason for panpsychism that says that there is one consciousness everywhere expressing itself in different ways. And the way in which it expresses itself, biobiology says, please interpret this as reality. And then when we interpret it as reality, we relate to it, but it doesn't solve all the problems because the problems of pain and difficulty is not solved by that. It's only survival, biological survival, but psychological survival, it doesn't happen. And the more complex the system, the more complex the species, the more complex the problems. In Africa, all the animals in the wild, they don't sit and ask, you know, why is the grass green? Why do I eat leaves? You know, the cow doesn't decide, you know, now let me see, I'm eating this grass. So I have to chew it and chew it. And uh, oh, it's come up, I have to chew it again. And he doesn't count and calculate how many times he had to regurgitate in order to digest this difficult thing, this, uh, this uh, cellulosis found in grass requires, a cow requires four stomachs. A horse eats the same thing, but it has to eat more of it because it doesn't get fully digested. And we analyze what came out. We see it's all rough and partly digested. A cow is much better. It's all smooth because four stomachs are there. The biology has given it four stomachs to use. We have one stomach. So all of this way of dealing with life biologically inherited through a series of learned behavioral changes. And we don't think that this is the only life where we start and learn things from scratch. Nor does any biologist think this because the whole theory of biological evolution says that we are descended from a common origin. Now we go one step further. We say, yes, that common origin is what we call self. What we misunderstand and misinterpret as self is I'm the body. So we say, I'm the self body. And if we're a little bit more sophisticated, we say, I am the self body and mind personality, something like that, that whole combination, but primarily body. And therefore, it's no wonder that we attend to this body, but we didn't put the caveat in the waking state. <laughs> as soon as we put that caveat on in the waking state, automatically we've revalued everything. As soon as we include that in our language and add that on in the waking state, things happen like this or in the dream state. And so this is what Ramakrishna highlights beautifully. Yes, this is real, but it has a relative reality and that goes off and another reality comes called a dream and that goes off and another reality comes, a sense of peace and that goes off. And then the one that observed it, that supreme thinker behind all thinkings, that never came, that never went. And that being infallible, every thought is infallible. unless a counter thought is given and neutralize it, that means the advantage of this understanding, the practical advantage is that we can consciously, deliberately create our own reality and we're doing it anyway. So just like the computer where the small icon was part of an interface only and useful for us, we don't dismiss it as an unreality, it's useful to us. If we say, I know I don't want any icons, it's only unreality, let's do away with this interface, then I've lost a whole uh, book that I was trying to compile and eventually publish and so on and so forth, edit, edit it day by day and so on. So there's something useful there. But I always have to keep in mind 
that is not the underlying thing. It is only the thing that enables me to usefully make an interchange and usefully deal with something in the waking state. In the dream state, there's another interface that comes up. In deep sleep, another interface comes up. But the truth about it is hidden. If it wasn't hidden, then this whole game would stop and end. The whole thing would finish. The play would finish. Everybody would bow, exit, and that's the end of it. So if somebody gives me a hundred acres of land, say, full of tall grass, with a, with a soil that is suitable for building something solid, and I think that maybe a garden should be in one corner, vegetables in another, maybe an apiary where we can have bees and make honey in some other quarter, and maybe a suitable building, say octagonal in shape, where people can come and meditate and enjoy the gardens. Supposing somebody gives me a hundred acres of land like that, then surely from that one creative area, if I do put, put that consciously and consciously construct it, surely resources will come from all different directions. If unasked that happens, then when asked as it were, then all the things get filled in. So that means that I the thinker behind all thinkings, behind all this range of awaking and dream and dreamless sleep world, can use the potentiality. And from a cosmic point of view and an individual point of view also, there being no difference. The Mondukhi Upanishad which deals with the subject of the three states of consciousness will tell us that the ruler of this dreamless sleep state will be pratnya, consciousness itself, will be something like nature, something like that area of poised potentiality from which everything else comes. And that the dream will be ruled by Hiranyagarbha, that is cosmic mind. And that waking state will be ruled by Vishwa, these are not three separate entities. These are three labels that allow us to trace a, a manifesting, a manifesting drama that we call our life. So that is the usefulness of that. And that is dealing with the subject of reality as put in here and specifically with the three states of consciousness in mind. So how do we get used to this idea? Well, this philosophy allows us to do that. Scripture allows us to do that. There are many helps. But primarily, we have the capacity for imagination. And when we think that there is a cosmic entity poised, then what's the first thing, creative thing that comes out? Image making. There's a creative movement. And if you take panpsychism in its current state, with many varieties, of course, then we can say, okay, not only do we understand it to be so, but we can also understand that it is something useful as well. If this is a drama and a game in an uncontrolled way, then we can take it and control it and make something better. So it comes to understanding that what we view as solid along with physics is not what we see. Now we knew that long ago, of course, because unfortunately in the Second World War, they took a solid thing, the hydrogen atom, and they blasted it away and it was no longer solid. It's only radiation. That means everything that is solid, which contains atoms, and every object does, is bottled energy, ready for to be released. 
and more than that, because that bottled energy, the most subtle form of it will be thought itself. If we take thought as a kind of bottled energy, we can release it and shape any reality that we want. And we're doing it. But to do it specifically, to do it deliberately, to do it in a, an imaging way, a structured way, using the full capacity of our creative imagination, constructing any dream we want, and it condensing here, it can be useful. But there has to be a spirit of generosity that goes with it. Otherwise, it will be painful for us. So the example that I typically give will be, supposing a farmer is on a farm and he has a drought and requires rain, and he has a great faith in God, dispense of rain. Lord, please give me the rain. I will put a sense, certain sense of humor in there. In the cosmic area, a request comes. Something like an email arrives or a text. This farmer wants rain. All right. In the cosmic storehouse, all the rain comes on his land and ruins all his crops. It would be much better if he had said, may everybody get rain. Everybody includes him, all inclusive formula. Then everybody gets the share. So to encourage the spirit of generosity is a necessary thing. And to then see if we can make these states of reality a much better reality in the face of those who are not seeing it this way. And their role in the drama is a destructive one. So I joked the other day, the other week, a kind of story that all the planets got together in the solar system for a conference. How are you? Fine. How are you? Yes. All good. My, sa my satellites are working well, says Saturn. And the rings are all fine and so on. And Mars says, oh, we had a small thing there, a robot. We're not sure what it's doing. Anyway, we'll leave it be for the time being. How are you, Earth? You don't look very well. Oh, no, no, I'm very sick. Oh, what are you suffering from? This homo sapiens sapiens. <laughs> and the other friends, planetary friends say, don't worry, it won't last long. So in the waking state, what way are we doing? Endorsing it as reality, we're destroying the resources to realize this state of three consciousness, uh, three states of consciousness and this reality and inhibiting generations from discovering the central truth, regardless of it, regardless of that, that cosmic knower, thinker, witness will still thrust forward, will still exhibit. And on the cosmic scale, will enact its drama and finalize it and go into a state of potential residency, potentiality where nothing is getting disturbed. And after eons of human time in the waking state, which is unfair, we can't apply that anywhere. We can only apply it in our solar, not even in our solar system, but we can only apply it from Earth. But in that cosmic drama, it goes into that state of latency and erupts again. And this is the cycl cyclic view of cosmology. We don't say there's a beginning because saying something has a beginning comes with problems. It doesn't come with solutions. So recognizing that the pattern of the whole of nature is cyclical, we see this happening on the cosmic level and we see a repetition of the cycle which we describe as three states. There being consciousness only, three states occur. Starting off as a kind of amorphous, dreamless sleep, evolving further into subtle waves, something like a dream state, and condensing, as it were, as a waking state. And if you put it in that order, then we'll say that the dreamless sleep is the most real. So why not revalue it? Instead of saying, I slept, say, I sat, with, I sat on God's throne. Only God and I were there. 
I see there's a question in chat. Let me see. How does this relate to DNA? And what is DNA and where does it come from? Oh. So you forgot to add, thank you for your question. You forgot to add the addendum in the waking state. And when, as soon as you put that in, you, your question is answered. So let's analyze this question a little bit more. How does this, this is the three states of consciousness, relate to DNA? Because DNA is a structure within the waking state and we don't even think about it in a dream. Nobody analyzes it in a dream. And then, and where does it come from? So let's look at it from a more biological point of view in the waking state. So now we, we are different. There's no standard answer to any question. That's the first thing we have to state. So how are we approaching it? If we approach it from this point of view of states of consciousness, you won't get your answer as you've shown. If we say, all right, let's say that we view this waking state in the same way everybody else views it as a biological reality. Then the question is, where does this DNA come from? Was that the question? Let me just see it again. How does this relate to DNA? Well, what is DNA? Okay. Where does it come from? All right. But if I look at it from a molecular biology point of view, DNA are molecules. Dioxyribonucleic acid is the structure. And it is actually the plan within a cell. Now, it is related. It is related to the subject in as much as in every state of consciousness, think of it as a development or manifestation of a central consciousness that is operating through something. If it wasn't like that, these three states of consciousness would find no relationship to the central entity that is itself manifesting as these three states. So we would have to find signatures in all of these things. We find signatures in the dreamless sleep as bliss. They have a blissful sleep. And the characteristic of this self, ultimate self, underlying self, would be exactly the same as Brahman, that it is already described as existence itself. In other words, it's not non-existent. The fact that all these things disappear doesn't leave us with a nothing. So it's existent, it's existence itself. And we've discussed how it is consciousness. And then it is bliss. Now we can actually relate this to more of the, uh, we can put this in reverse and say, supposing we said that the dream is sleep is characteristic of bliss. And we can say that the dream is characteristic of consciousness. And we can say that the waking state is a characteristic of all three. All brought out in an existent form where Existence and survival is dominant. Supposing we will say that, then there must be some intrinsic pattern that enables this existence or continued existence that we call survival. And so within every cell, there has to be an internal structure that sets a driving mechanism that if there's a design for it, if there's a consciousness, we find, have to find it as something that is developed and designed. Richard Dawkins in his Selfish Gene book of the 1970s, postulating neo-Darwinism, which is now gone really, it's no longer tenable, most of it anyway, he would think that the central genome is this DNA, and we know it's wrong. Because if you extract DNA from a cell and put it in a petri dish and leave it for a thousand years, it won't do anything. It'll sit there. And so there's an ingenuity in the design of the cells. And he'll say, it looks as if it's designed. It appears to be designed is the language he used. Yes. 
If it appears to be designed, maybe it's designed. So there is a, an exhibition coming through, an intricacy there, beautifully complex. And it's there in more or less every organic cell, other than those who don't have that structure, they only have the RNA, such as the virus, for example, COVID virus. It has to hook into another structure, replicating structure, actually, use it as a host in order to replicate. That's the mechanism we're dealing with. And we know how adaptable it is. And in science, interesting enough, the virus is not labeled as a living organism. I think people have now changed their minds on it because there's no question that it has a capacity to adapt. And that's what we're dealing with. And what that means is there's an internal movement to survive an internal thrust to survive, an urge to do it. Because behind us is existence itself. If it wasn't like that, then there'd be no urge to exist. The whole basis of natural selection is unexplained unless there is some urge to exist. Therefore, existence itself that comes out as consciousness by designing components in order to adapt to the environment and perpetuate itself. So the DNA is an architectural structure. It's the architect, a remarkable thing. Your whole potentiality is contained within it, but it has to work in cooperation, not in isolation. So today we know that there's a whole complex of interactions Instead of saying that the DNA is the foundational thing, the actual genome, we take the genome to be the whole cell. And instead of saying that there's an upward causation, DNA, and then everything else, we have to put a horizontal, not a vertical structure, a horizontal structure that says that the cell is designed to compensate, adapt, and change to the stochastic varieties which are there. This stochasticism is a term that is used for variety, random variety, unexpected things. And the cell knows how to adapt and make a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, etc. And all of the components of the cell work in cooperation. And we know from something called epigenetics, that the cell responds to its environment, selecting what it requires somehow, and that the membrane of the cell is really the discerning aspect of it. If you will, it's the brain of the cell. It allows things to come in, prohibits things that it doesn't want, has a very complex uh, filtering mechanism, if you like, selective mechanism, and then it's surrounding the DNA, which is fixed and working as switch on, switch off buttons. This is a, an area that we now call epigenetics. It's not a recent thing. So there are drugs now being manufactured, epigenetic drugs that say we can deal with something by changing the behavior of the DNA cell. So where does this all fit? It means that if thought is the most powerful thing and can influence the body in a moment, in an instant, straight away, if you doubt it, think right now of the most delicious meal you ever had, it won't take long before saliva flows in your mouth and gastric juice flows in your stomach. So this thought is faster than the speed of light. Every thought will affect every single cell of the body. And the, these, these cells operate in an epigenetic way. That is, it forces them to respond to the environment and then put constrictors or releases on the DNA itself. DNA is fixed. But the way it operates is changeable. That means we can consciously, deliberately, change our behavior in the waking state. Why would we do that? Is because if we change our behavior in the waking state, 
we open the avenue for a greater clarity, better purity, and closer, a closer condition to the truth. We get into that poised condition that transcends these states of consciousness. And there we sit in our absolute reality, reality of ourself. All right, so 12 o'clock, 12 noon. So I'll keep quiet while maybe some final question comes up or comments. Lionel says, I relate to this question of the DNA, the research on the DNA, had some complex modifications throughout history, isn't it? Um, yes, certainly complex modifications are there. Uh, so in this way that the, the genetic compositions are similar throughout the whole range of organic species, there's no doubt. But we understand the differences by virtue of the number of chromosomes and the variety of that. And it's not in the number of chromosomes that provide the A complexity. For example, rice has more chromosomes than humans. So if you were to say that the, the, if on the basis of the numbers of chromosomes, you would say that rice is the super species. Now we make sure it's not by, by, by picking it, husking it and eating it. All right, we'll finish it off. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. And benach day, he guru, gurlaya. Oh.